The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Zilek. I am with ICF, and we are the vendor working on behalf of the sponsors of Energize Connecticut to bring these passive house and all electric homes trainings to all of you. So thanks for joining us today. We will be recording this training and we will make this available afterwards. These trainings are at no cost, thanks to the sponsors of Energize Connecticut and are part of a partnership with Connecticut Passive House. Um, a quick reminder that as part of this training and workforce development initiative, we are offering a 75% cost reimbursement for individuals pursuing either FIAS or fee professional accreditation. So this includes the cost of the trainings and the exam. And once you become certified, we'll work with you to process the 75% cost reimbursement. Um, if you have any questions on that, um, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Keegan, who is also with ICF, to talk about the Passive House and All Electric Homes Building Incentives. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're excited to have you for today's webinar. As Anna said, uh, in addition to the no-cost educational training series and the professional accreditation reimbursements, uh, the sponsors of Energize Connecticut also offer robust incentives uh, Aaron, if you want to go to the next one, uh, for builders and developers who choose to either go all electric with their residential building projects or pursue passive house certification in multifamily projects, specifically with five units or more. Um, next one, the passive house incentive design uh, for Energize Connecticut is shown here. It includes pre-construction incentives for uh, feasibility studies and energy modeling and post-construction incentives for full passive house certification. Uh, Aaron, if you want to go to the next one. Uh, the uh, the all electric incentive uh, also includes uh, robust incentives for uh, projects that choose um, specifically to go all electric, removing removing fossil fuels from the building. Uh, there are two uh, levels for uh, incentives uh, shown here, uh, which uh, uh, can be achieved uh, through a variety of uh, methods. The goal is for everyone involved in uh, residential construction in the state of Connecticut to be aware of these incentives. So uh, for anyone interested in lear learning more, please do visit our website or contact us directly at the uh, information on the slide. Uh, for t questions during today's session, please feel free to use the chat function on your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, and Anna and I will relay them to uh, Aaron, today's presenter. And with that, I will uh, I will introduce Aaron Gunnarsson. Aaron. Hello, thank you, Keegan, and thank you, Anna, for uh, setting us up and arranging today's presentation. Looks like we have uh, quite a few people out there watching, so I'm uh, really uh, excited to be here and uh, present this to you. Um, those incentives that Keegan just reviewed uh, are, are fantastic. So uh, we've had uh, similar ones here in Massachusetts for, for a few years that have had uh, really uh, amazing participation from, from developers and project teams. And we've seen the, the number of uh, projects just skyrocket. So really exciting to see this in, in Connecticut and hope you guys are all taking advantage of them. Uh, today's session, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, past house, we call this past house basics, but really the idea is to focus on the building envelope and have kind of one session dedicated to talking about that aspect of past house building. So that's what we're going to do today. Um, for those who haven't seen me before, I'm I'm uh, up in Massachusetts. I'm the director of Passive House in Massachusetts. Uh, so we do a lot of training and education with that organization. We also focus a lot of outreach and advocacy uh, and have a, a partnered with uh, Pass House Connecticut in the past and hope to do a lot more work with them in the future as well as uh, Pass House keeps growing here in the region. So here's a, a scatter shot of different Pass House projects. Um, for those on this call, I this is, you know, we're not going to go over a lot of what Pass House itself is and the metrics. We're going to, you know, jump into the building envelope. So I hope you guys all have a little bit of familiarity with, with Passive House uh, in general. Um, but the kind of the main, you know, the first first big lesson that everyone learns, uh, Passive House doesn't just mean house, it means all building types. So you're seeing here a, a picture of different types of buildings, residential buildings, multifamily buildings. Um, you have a down in the lower right corner, have a very large skyscraper and office building in downtown Boston. So a wide variety of different types of buildings that can be Passive House. Uh, we've also seen um, in different parts.
parts of the world, not not quite here in New England yet, but we've seen passive house, uh, firehouses, hospitals, um, uh, car dealerships, a, a wide range of different types of buildings. So we're looking at all different types of buildings that can achieve passive house uh, and retrofits as well. Uh, this is an existing building in New York that was retrofitted to be a passive house. Uh, but this really gets at what we focus on with the building envelope. I think. For passive house, this is kind of what a lot of people think of in their mind. They think of this, well, sweater or blanket being thrown over the house and keeping the heat in in the winter or keeping it out in the summer. Um, and this is what it looks like under a thermal image. There's obviously the blue one there in the middle, uh, but you're seeing the heat is not escaping like it does to other buildings. But we're not just talking about um, thermal performance and the ability to say spend less on your energy bills. There's lots of other benefits to having this robust building envelope. Um, so this is just one story about that. This is uh, a house in Texas. So the the one you see in your photo, this was actually a retrofit. So it was renovated to be a passive house in uh, 2020. I think they actually renovated it. The following year, Texas experienced this deep freeze in winter. Um, they experienced one this past winter as well. Um, this is a story of the person who lives in this house. They experienced this deep freeze. It's, um, their power went out at 1 a.m. Uh, so they had no power at their house or in the neighborhood. Uh, when they woke up that morning, it was nine degrees outside in their home, 62 degrees. Um, a little, probably a little colder than they had their thermostat set originally, but still, you know, really good, um, comfortable. <laughs> Um, their neighbor's house, which is not a passive house, had already gone down to 36 degrees. Um, so that's that's the difference you're seeing in, in the ability to, we, we sometimes call this shelter in place or, you know, withstand um, drastic weather conditions. And this is one of the benefits to having this type of robust building envelope in a passive house, is even without mechanical systems working, you can keep that heat in and stay comfortable for a longer duration than you can in a typical home. I do see a comment here about my sound, so I hope uh, it is improved here. Um, so let's get into the building. Now. Very, very, you know, simple overview. This is a conventional home, leaks all over the place. The air just escapes everywhere. The heat escapes everywhere. Um, not good. What does a pass house do? Well, it fixes that by implementing a few basic principles, having an airtight envelope, having continuous insulation, reducing the thermal bridging through the envelope, and then providing some of these mechanical systems to make up for, for everything else. But that's, that's what we're doing. We're going from that leaky house to a tight house. So that's a very, very simple uh, version of it. And we're gonna get a lot more in depth as we go through this. Um, quick building science sort of lesson here, just to kind of conceptually think about what is happening in a building. So air pressure and thermal temperature want to be in balance. So the thermal temperature um, is, is moving due to temperature differences. So it's moving from hot to cold. So that so in winter, that hot air in your home wants to go to the cold outside. It, it, think of it that way. It, it wants to do that. We need to keep it from doing that. We need to keep it inside. But if we don't, that hot air is going to find a way out. Uh, air also moves due to pressure differences, so it can move from high pressure to low pressure. This is one of the reasons for the, the concept of hot air rising in the home, um, because air wants to wants to do that, wants to move up to that lower pressure area. So in, a, in winter, hot air is going to rise, it's going to move through those gaps in the attic, in the roof, in your top floors. As that happens, you're going to have a pressure difference, and you're going to have cold air being drawn in through the gaps in the basement and your lower floors. At the same time, you're going to have heat conducting through materials. So heat moves through the air flow, but it's also conducting through the materials in the wall. This is why we use insulation to, to reduce that thermal conductivity of heat. So that's kind of the basic building science behind some of this air and temperature movement that we're trying to control in our walls. What we do is provide an air and thermal barrier to reduce this. So some materials that we put into our walls and into our envelopes are going to provide thermal resistance, insulation, of course. Um, but there are other materials that we put in these in our building envelope that are going to be conductors. Uh, thermal bridges is, is kind of, it's a term we use. These are your, your wood studs, or, um, but there's many other examples of those as we go through this. I'll, I'll talk about thermal bridges. But those are things that are in that wall that are going to allow heat to transfer. We're also going to have gaps in the envelope. Um, 
that is where air can go right through. So a big part of us producing a, this passive house level building envelope is reducing those air gaps. Um, our value, we're not going to talk a lot about our value today. Um, what that means, though, and so you're familiar with it, is it's a measure of the material or envelope's thermal resistance. So higher R value is better. One thing to keep in mind with R value is it doesn't measure air movement. So if you talk about the R value of a wall, that's talking about the, the ability of that, that wall to reduce thermal uh, heat transfer. But it has no real, you know, real, um, has really nothing to say about the air transfer through that wall. So just keep that in mind when you hear about the differences between R value walls. Is you're not talking about air movement. Um, the other concepts we're going to get into here today are also liquid water and water vapor. So our wall, our wall envelope is not just controlling air and thermal heat transfer. It's also controlling the movement of liquid water and water vapor. Uh, so water primarily moves by, by gravity. It's going to flow down the house. But it can also move by suction forces. So there are certain materials that can act almost as sponges and kind of draw up moisture. Um, water vapor is going to generally move by diffusion from high pressure to low pressure. Um, and some materials that we put in our walls are going to be barriers to liquid water. Um, some are going to be barriers to water vapor. Some are going to be open to water vapor. And we'll talk a little bit about it as we go through today's session on what that means, what different materials are going to have those, those effects. And, what kind of wall we want. Do we want it vapor open? Do we not? So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, one thing that comes up when you talk about vapor movement in, in a wall is something called the perm rating. And I'll talk about this a little bit, I think, later when we get into, into vapor control. But perm rating is just the measure of a, a material's vapor permeability, with the lower number being, being less permeable to vapor movement. So these are just some quick background building science concepts to keep in mind as we go through this. What this results in is a wall um, or a building envelope uh, that has four control area uh, control layers or four barriers. So thermal barrier or heat barrier, as sometimes it gets called, air, vapor, and water. So your thermal barrier is how we're reducing the thermal conduction of heat through these materials. Um, air barrier is how we're reducing the uncontrolled movement of heat, water, and pollutants in the air. Um, and I think it's important to think of it in, in those kind of senses. The air movement, air moves heat, it also moves water vapor, and it moves pollutants through the air. So what we do through this kind of wall system is control that air movement. Um, you can kind of see the little notes here for that thermal barrier is kind of like that sweater we throw over a building. But obviously, if you ever worn it, worn a sweater in winter, you know it's going to keep you warm. But if there's a lot of wind, that air is still going to blow through the sweater. So the air barrier is like the, the windbreaker you put on top of that to keep the wind from, from blowing through. Um, vapor barrier, this is managing how water vapor moves through the envelope um, and keeps it from becoming trapped inside the envelope. Um, this might be the raincoat, perhaps, that keeps the water vapor from coming in. Um, and the water barrier then keeps the building dry. And when it does get wet, allows it to dry out. Um, kind of an important concept to keep in mind there. We do whatever we can to keep something dry, but we always plan for it to fail. We know it's going to get wet. So your water control layer also allows the building to dry out. So we'll go through. So today when we talk about the building envelope, kind of keep these four control layers in mind and think about, you know, the things that we talk about, how they apply to these four different layers. And I'll kind of remind you. Um, here's just, I, I got two of these images I'm going to show you, just give you a quick kind of idea of how the different layers of a wall contribute to these four control layers. So this is, um, this is, so if we look at this wall, what you have is you have drywall on the inside. Uh, you then have uh, two by six wood studs um, with fiberglass in the cavities in between. You then have zip system sheeting going on top of that. Zip system is a sheet material that's going to pro also provide uh, a dedicated air barrier uh, when it's installed properly. Uh, so that is the air barrier of the building in this case. It then has a mineral wool put on top of that, which provides the exterior insulation, then a rain screen and uh, siding. And you can see on, on the right side of this how those what each of those layers are in terms of the air barrier, uh, thermal barrier, water, and vapor. One thing you'll notice if you look at the bottom is that there isn't actually a dedicated vapor barrier in this wall system. This is what we call vapor open. Now, this is still a method of vapor control. 
And that's kind of why I refer to these as the control layers as opposed to the barriers, which is also a, a term that gets used because we're really trying to control this. You're not always going to have a vapor barrier in the wall, but we are controlling vapor in the, in the sense that this wall system allows that vapor to move and keeps the assembly vapor open, which allows it to stay dry. So that's one example. Here's a different um, a one, very similar, but you know, you can see they did things a little bit differently. Uh, they still use basically drywall, two by six wood studs, dense packed with cellulose, but then they use just regular plywood as their sheeting, uh, which means they needed a different air barrier because they didn't have a dedicated air barrier on the sheeting. So they used uh, a fluid applied air barrier in this case. And we're going to go, we're going to talk more about what, you know, these different types of air barrier systems are. But that's what they used here. They then use, um, you see they put on, uh, sorry, some G joists on the outside, which gave them a lot of space uh, for insulation. And they put two layers of oil-based polyiso, rain screen and siding. But you can see here how these layers, again, are providing your air, heat and water uh, protection. Uh, and one thing to note, if you go down to the bottom of vapor management, you'll see that in this case, this system is, is what we consider vapor closed in the sense that it's open to the inside. Uh, but it doesn't go all the way through the assembly. And that's because polyiso is working as a, a vapor barrier in this case. Um, when we get to vapor control, I'll talk a little bit about the differences in terms of vapor permeability of some of these materials. Uh, but that's what this one does. It allows it to dry the inside. So these are just two different types of assemblies, but it's giving you kind of a quick way to conceptualize how the different layers of the wall act as our control layers. So, Let's get into the features of the envelope. So we have that kind of background knowledge, keep that in mind as we go through this. But what we're gonna spend the rest of the time doing is hitting these bullet points. So we're gonna talk about the building envelope. We're gonna start with the concept of advanced framing, which is the, you know, that's the frame of the building. And we're gonna talk about how we think about that in terms of passive house. Uh, then we're gonna move on to cavity insulation, the insulation we put in between the frames. Then we're going to talk about exterior insulation, so that sweater we're wrapping around the building. We're then going to talk about our airtight barrier, so how we create an airtight envelope and what barrier systems we use. Then we're going to talk about how we mitigate uh, thermal bridges, so how we reduce the impact of thermal bridges through that envelope. And then lastly, we'll talk about some of that water and vapor control layers in this. Um, again, I think that Keegan mentioned asking questions, so please feel free to do so as we go through this. I want to make sure, you know, I'm really addressing the, the things you guys want to know about. So ask questions and we can, uh, we can address those. I might hold off on some until the end, um, but I'm happy to address some during this as well for relevant. So ask questions as we go through it. Well, let's get started. Um, we're going to talk about advanced framing for us all. Actually, you know what, let me, let me show this picture before we do much, because I'll explain a little bit about this is the distillery, which is uh, a multifamily passive house in South Boston. Uh, but this is showing you, you know, these different layers. So they have framing behind this. They did, uh, I think, two by six wood studs, um, spaced 24 inches on center, and they dense packed that with, uh, I believe, fiberglass in this case. Um, and that, so that's their framing and their cavity insulation. On top of that, they put zip system sheeting. So at the very top of this image, the green material material is zip system sheeting. Um, and zip system, of course, uh, is going to provide your sheeting, uh, so your structural sheeting there, but it also has a dedicated air barrier on it. So when it's applied properly, you have an air barrier system. So that's what they use in this case. On top of that zip system, they put three inches of mineral wool, and that's the brown material that you're seeing in the majority of the image. Mineral wool is uh, high quality insulation material. That's what they use as their exterior insulation. On top of that, the various white and black lines you're seeing, is, that's their rain screen. That's what allowing them to create an air gap between the insulation and the siding. And that air gap is where things can dry out when they get wet. And we'll talk about that when we get into water and vapor control. And then they put their siding on top. So that's, that's the wall system you're looking at there, the building envelope. So let's go to the inside of it and we'll talk about advanced framing first. This is where it starts. The goals of advanced framing here are reducing thermal bridging from wall studs and from headers and from other uh, material in the wall and creating more space for cavity insulation. These are kind of our, that's, that's what we're doing when we do advanced framing. And advanced framing is, 
it's kind of a catch-all term. It, you know, it's not a necessarily a specific method of framing, but it's simply doing a few things differently compared to traditional framing to allow for less thermal bridging and more cavity space. As a bonus, it can actually reduce project costs by reducing lumber usage. Um, we certainly had a, a lot of uh, kind of increasing lumber lumber costs uh, in the last couple of years, so this has been a, actually a benefit. A lot of uh, uh, project teams have noticed. Um, so it's one way that we can. There's lots of things in past loss projects that might increase costs. There's other things that you can tweak to lower costs. Reducing lumber is one of the ways to lower costs in these projects. So we'll talk about uh, a few different ways that advanced framing gets implemented. So first of all, in the studs, this one is as simple as spacing the studs farther apart. So traditionally, we're going to do 24 inches on center, as opposed to what you might see in a, a more typical construction of, say, 16 inches on center. Um, all this does is it reduces the amount of studs that are in that wall. So that reduces the thermal bridging from those studs, and it gives us more space in between the studs for insulation. Um, and this image you're seeing is just kind of showing you, this is just, you know, it's a general image. It's not going to be true of every single wall, but gives you a basic idea that in most construction that's being done 16 inches on center, about 25% of that wall is just wood. So no matter, you know, what our value of insulation we're putting in there, how good it is, a quarter of that wall just is not impacted by it all. It's wood. So we want to reduce that down. Um, and the little note at the bottom is, is kind of an interesting way to think about this, but if you just think about a traditionally framed 16, on, 16 inch on center wall, and you say have uh, our value of 19 in there with the insulation, your wall system, your whole wall is not an R19 wall. It would be at best an R12 wall, and that's because you have to account for all that thermal bridging from the wood that actually lowers the R value, the effective R value of that wall. So what we're doing through advanced framing is helping to solve that problem. So other places this comes up is in corners. This is a very, I think, um, common place, especially in traditional homes where we see these type, where we see a, a need for improvement. So in typical framing, this is how a corner is done. Um, the problem with this is in that little center area in between those three studs, you have a gap, and that gap is not going to get filled with insulation. So you have, uh, you have thermal bridging problems from that, from that wood, um, and you have a gap where you won't have insulation. So there's ways to get around that. So here's two methods um, of changing that. But in the middle, uh, we're still using three studs, but we're alternating or we're just changing the orientation of one of them uh, so that that way insulation can get put in behind it. So now you're, you have insulation in there. You solve that problem, but you still have a lot of thermal bridging. Um, so one another way to do that is through advanced option two, which you're eliminating that that stud that's there, and you're just going to those two studs. Now you have even more space for insulation. You have less thermal bridging, um, but what you you lose out on is a way to attach that drywall because you don't have that stud there. So you have to use some type of drywall clip, which is what this image is indicating. Uh, but those clips are widely available, not very costly. So a really good option to allow you to have that corner. Uh, where you're reducing thermal bridging, increasing the potential for insulation. Another place you can implement advanced framing techniques are in headers. Um, this can be done by reducing the amount of headers um, or having, in this case, what you're seeing are insulated headers. This is making sure that we're providing a way to insulate it. You could do on the left, you're seeing insulation in the middle of the header. So you have kind of two, um, two of your of wood beams on either side and the insulation in the middle. On the right, you're seeing it done where the insulation is being put on, on the inside. Um, either way works. Um, the, the one in the, on the left takes a little bit more planning because you have to put the insulation in before you close up the, the header. Um, the one on the right, the insulation can be done at the same time as the rest of your insulation. But either way, the principle is the same. We're making sure that that header gets insulation put in. So um, that's advanced framing. I'm going to move on now to cavity insulation. I should mention with advanced framing, there's lots of other things that can discuss about this, lots of other ways that the principles uh, can be implemented. But if you just just focus on the fact that advanced framing techniques do these two main goals, reducing thermal bridging from wall studs and headers and et cetera, and creating more space for cavity insulation. And if you think about it in that concept, there's many, many other ways this can be implemented. 
So now we're going to move on to cavity insulation. And again, please ask questions if you have them, um, and I'll take time to answer them. But we're going to talk now about cavity insulation. So we have our framing. Ideally, we have 24 inches on center framing with lots of space for cavity insulation, and we're going to put it in there. What cavity insulation does? Very simple. Provides part of the thermal barrier of the building. You know, along with exterior insulation, it is our thermal barrier. Um, you're seeing two different images here. On the left, uh, you're seeing mineral wool insulation stuck into the cavities of a building. On the right, you're seeing some of the blow-in insulation um, that might be cellulose in this case, um, or it might be another type of blow-in insulation that they're blowing. So different types of, of material out there. These are the four most common that I see. Uh, so we have fiberglass, which is probably the most traditional type of cavity insulation that's out there, but it's still used in, in even in past house projects. Um, next to that on the right is the mineral wool insulation, which is in this case mineral wool bats, which is being put into the cavities. Uh, you have cellulose, which is going to be blown in, which you're seeing there on the bottom left. And then on the bottom right is spray foam. So those are kind of the four main types of cavity insulation that I see. Um, let's kind of, you know, Note some of the, the things that you see in these images, uh, kind of takeaways. You can see kind of the safety material a lot of people are wearing, gloves, masks, that might clue you in to some of the decision making that you might have in insulation. Uh, some of this stuff can be a little bit more toxic than others or contain uh, more dangerous chemicals that you that need to be you know, installed properly uh, with proper PPE materials. So those are some things that you might want to consider. Uh, in the lower left image, uh, the blown in cellulose, um, you can it, it's kind of hard to see in the image, but that one actually has this, this kind of screen that's attached to the studs first, and that's what holds the insulation in. So there's that extra step of attaching that material and then blowing the insulation in. So there's, those are kind of the differences here that you're seeing. Now, no matter what you do, whatever type of insulation you're using, proper insulation is, is critical. Um, all of these different things can be installed correctly or, or not correctly. It's going to have a huge impact. In some cases, even a, a greater impact than the type of insulation you pick is going to be how it's installed. So dense packed insulation, like say dense packed cellulose, is going to settle if it's not installed at the right density. So there's going to be a certain density based on the material and the volume of space. And you want to make sure, say your insulation contractor who's putting that in is doing it at the, the correct density and what it's spec for. Because if it's, if it's you know, getting lower density, you're going to have settling in that wall. Um, bats have to be sized uh correctly for the cavities spaces that they fill uh so they have to be cut correctly and sized correctly so that you don't have any gaps um you don't have any compression um looser insulation can get pressed so that's what you're seeing in this image the top right corner or top left corner of the image you're seeing compressed insulation um, and it might actually be a little counterintuitive sometimes i i hear folks who install this stuff say well if we get it in there really tight that's better and that's not actually the, the case you don't want it to be, be compressed. Uh, that's going to reduce the thermal uh, protection that it has. So things need to be sized correctly and installed correctly. Uh, spray foam, um, a note on that is it may not expand to the desired thickness. So that needs you know, some quality checking to go back over after it expands and make sure that you achieve the right, right thickness that you want. Um, so these are some things to keep in mind with cavity insulation. Um, a lot of it is, is this type of application, you know, regardless of which of these materials you're picking, you're just making sure it's being installed right so that you kind of maintain the, I guess, the principles of having that entire cavity filled and filled at the proper density. Um, we're going to move on now to exterior insulation. Again, ask questions. I'm not seeing any come up here, but folks, you got a lot of you out there. If you want me to talk more about certain stuff or you have questions about it, definitely jump in. Aaron. So, Oh, yes. There are a couple, actually. Oh, they are. Great. Okay. Um, I, unfortunately, it doesn't look like I can see them, but if there's a couple that are relevant, you can let me know. Yeah, maybe you did touch on it, but they missed missed out. Um, it's about studs. So if moving from Ooh. 16 to 24-inch stud, mm -hmm. um, does it improve the effective R value, like from R12 to, to Yes. R? Yeah, great question. So yeah, so I gave that kind of example, uh, that little story, if you have, you know, an R, Kim, or what it was, R19 wall conditional framing that's actually going down to more like an R12 effectively. Yes, it is. 
So that is without a doubt the, the goal, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in many ways by having more cavity insulation and having less thermal bridging, you're going to have a higher effective R value in the wall. Uh, what it's going to increase to there. I mean, there's so many factors that go into that. I can't, you know, it's going to be better. <laughs> um, it's going to, you know, the type of insulation you're using, the, it, there's a lot of things to think about with that. Um, one thing I did mention when I was talking about the studs is I mentioned how, you know, you're spacing them. But I did mention um, using, say, some projects will use two by eights versus, say, a two by six. And that's going to give you even more uh, space, you know, in the other direction for insulation. So there's other ways that you can increase the amount of cavity insulation in there. Um, but that's a good question. It, it is going to change the, the R value. That's kind of the goal to have that more effective R value. Okay. Uh, a couple well, more. Um, what is the film used for the spray insulation? Is it vapor? Permeable. Um, the the film used for you mean so is that about the spray foam here? Um, yeah. Um, um, it's yeah. Vapor oh. permeable. So uh, spray foam generally won't be. So that is another trade off, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get into vapor control. But then it's going to be one of the kind of decisions in terms of insulation what you use is yeah spray foam, especially closed cell spray spray foam is going to be a vapor impermeable. So that's going to be something to consider in the wall. Um, other things to consider are how the insulation might deal with moisture. Uh, mineral wool, for example, um, deals really well with moisture. It doesn't, you know, soak it up, um, doesn't get, it's not, doesn't have a whole lot of danger of kind of holding moisture and creating mold. Cellulose um, can hold moisture. So that's a, a risk that's, you know, greater with cellulose than it is with mineral wool. Um, there's also costs involved, which are going to be different for all these materials. And then a concept that we don't aren't going to talk a whole lot about today, but um, if you have questions about it, I, I can kind of comment, is the concept of body carbon, or how much energy it takes to produce these materials. And that varies from material to material as well. Of all these that are on the screen right now, cellulose is going to be the lowest in body carbon. Um, so it's kind of a, a short, good choice in that sense. I hope that gets at the question. Okay. Yeah, they just clarified the film containing the cellulose. The cellulose. Oh, the film. Yeah. So no, no. In that case, this this film is going to be vapor open. Um, it's it. Yeah, it's hard to see, but it's going to have a lot of little holes in it. Sometimes it might just be a screen that's put on there. Um, cellu the cellulose material. It's um, if you haven't actually held this stuff. It's kind of you can hold it in your hand. It's not. Uh, like dust, it's it's a little thicker than that, so you can have kind of a screen, and that's going to be enough to hold it in. Okay, and then someone wrote that it's it was their understanding that spray foam isn't very good for air tightness and should actually be avoided in passive house projects. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. So that is a very good point. One, what I would say about this is when we talk about the cavity insulation. If none of this is creating the air barrier. This is helping to create the thermal envelope of the building. So yes, in that case, we're not, this, this stuff is, this, this part of the wall assembly is not creating an air barrier, an airtight barrier. So even a spray foam um, is not great at creating the air barrier for the cavity insulation, it's not as critical. Okay, and- yeah. But yeah, if you're relying on it for your air barrier, there might be some challenges there. And maybe we'll come back to that when we get into the air barrier here in a, in a little bit. Okay. There was one more question. What happens if you have a leak in the cellulose walls? Yeah, <laughs> probably from what I just said, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, so if typically, so as you kind of think about going back to those, those slides I showed of a couple of different walls where one was completely vapor open, one was kind of closed to the outside, but could dry to the inside. If you, a lot of these homes that in this case are using cellulose are going to be those vapor open homes. They're not going to have a dedicated vapor barrier. So ideally, if you have a little bit of moisture in there, you're giving it an opportunity to dry out by having a vapor open. But it is a risk if you have, say, a, a large leak that the cellulose, so if you have a large leak in a cavity, you're probably going to have to, during the process of fixing that leak, take out the cellulose that's in that cavity and put new stuff in. Okay. It looks like that's it for now. We can. Great.
You can continue. <laughs> Great, keep them going. So we're gonna now move on to exterior insulation. And now we're talking about that insulation that's on the outside of the, of the building. So this is again, providing part of the thermal barrier. So along with the cavity insulation, this is what's creating the thermal uh, control layer or thermal barrier of our, of our building. The other uh, effect of, or other goal of exterior insulation is to reduce the impact of thermal bridging within the assembly. That'll be clear here. I'll kind of show a couple images. Um, what you're seeing on the right is a multifamily building called the Finch. Um, this is actually a large affordable housing multifamily building, but they're using, you can see mineral wool there as their exterior insulation. There's a lot of different materials, just like with cavity insulation. These are probably the most common that I see. So mineral wool boards, of course, I've shown a lot of images of those. There's also polyiso, so that's the image on the right. A uh, polyiso is sort of a, a foam-like material with a, usually with a foil facing on it. And that's what you're looking at there where it kind of looks like a silvery aluminum almost color there. That's a foil facing over a, a foam material. Um, wood fiber boards down the lower left. Uh, this is, I think, a little bit more of a newer material and I see it less frequently, but in terms of conversation, um, it's probably the, the one that I, at this point, I would think, I, I feel like project teams are the most interested in, it's the one they want to hear most about, even if they haven't used it yet. Uh, they seem to be curious to use it. Um, there is about to be uh, uh, this, this material. That, so what you're seeing in the image is a uh, Gupex. Uh, that's a material from Germany. But there is now about to be a, a manufacturer here locally in New England and Maine that's producing a very similar material locally. So I think there's going to be a lot more use of this in the coming years. Um, and then the lower right, you're seeing uh, just different types of foam, EPS, FPS. Uh, this comes in a lot of different uh, forms of foam boards do. Uh, sometimes you can have it in a kind of a structural foam board, which is what you're seeing in the, in the image, where it's attached to the sheeting. Um, you could also get a zip system uh, board that also has foam attached to it. They call it R-zip. Um, and then there's also just foam boards themselves that you can apply over your own sheeting. So there's a lot of different ways that the foam comes in, but in different methods, these are the ones that I, I see. Um, the, the impact this has on thermal bridging, this is just giving you a kind of way to, to illustrate it. This is that Finch Cambridge project that I showed you before. So we're on the inside of the building, uh, looking at an exterior wall on the left um, before the exterior insulation and on the right after. And you can see the, the difference in the thermal bridging of the wood studs. So we want to, of course, reduce thermal bridging in the wall through advanced framing methods but we know we're going to have some thermal bridges. We can't avoid it completely. So exterior insulation is one way to reduce that impact uh, because that way, if you can just picture it, you have a, a stud and now that stud is going to fit that exterior insulation. So the type of insulation you choose, I should say that this, this everything that's written on this screen applies to cavity insulation as well. Uh, but so the type that you're going to use is going to be driven by a lot of different factors. So costs, um, obviously materials are going to cost you know, their different prices um, and your project is going to have different goals in regard to that familiarity. So that comes into familiarity from a design perspective, but also from the contractors that you're using the trays and what they're familiar with using, that's going to influence your decision uh, and your project goals, um, such as reduction of embodied carbon. That's becoming a larger and larger goal. It's not a requirement of passive house, uh, but it is becoming a, a larger goal of teams that are building passive house projects is to reduce body carbon. So that's one fact. So, you know, just to give a sense, that, I mean, there's a lot of different factors that go into why you would pick different insulation over others. So the type of insulation is going to be driven by all those different things. The amount of insulation, you're going to determine that through your energy model. So when you do your passive house energy modeling, whether you're using Woofy or the passive house planning package, you're going to enter all the details you enter into that, and that's going to help you determine how much insulation you actually need. And it can vary. So here are three projects that use the exact same material. They use mineral wool and the same, and from the same manufacturer, I should say. So the, the, the same material in this case, but different amounts. The distillery had three inches of mineral wool on the outside. Uh, Finch Cambridge had two inches. And then we go to Wheaton College here, a residential hall at the, at the university had five inches of mineral wool. So big differences between them. And they were and that was driven by a lot of different factors, internal heat loads, 
thermal bridging, a lot of different things that go into determining how much insulation you need on the outside. We in college, one reason they needed five inches is because that was not a wood frame project, it was steel frame. Um, so there was a lot more thermal bridging because of that. So they needed great, a greater amount of insulation on the outside. But the way that they determined that was through their energy model. The way they decided on mineral wool was some combination of the first bullet points. Um, you know, it was a, some combination of that, they decided they wanted to use mineral wool. And then they figured out how much to use based on their energy model. So that's what I'm going to talk about with exterior insulation for the moment. And I'm going to go on to the air barrier. Uh, Anna, were there any questions uh, about insulation before I move yeah. on? Yeah, yeah, just a few more. Um, back to spray foam. Yeah. What is the reason to say that air can go through spray foam? Um, this person says they have had experiments that show um, that it, if it's sprayed properly, practically no air can go through. Yeah. Um, the issue is, is that caveat, if it's applied properly. And that is true of everything, but I think there's more issues tend to come up with spray foam. And it has to do with just the application of spray foam. You, it has to expand and it's not always going to expand the way you want it to or fill all the gaps you want it to. So that is kind of the, the issue that comes up with, with spray foam is it's not necessarily the, you know, the, um, the data sheet of the product and what it's capable of doing. But when you actually, but in, in practice, in projects, there tend to be more issues that come up with it where there's are little air gaps that it didn't properly expand into that have to be addressed later. Okay. And, so just, that's, and that's just, you know, that's anecdotal from folks who, you know, have used this and, and kind of things that they have said. So it's not that the, that it's a bad system, you know, that's not going to, that it's going to allow air to transfer through. It's just that the, the, um, the quality control of it is becomes that much more critical. Right. Someone just wrote um, again about spray foam, that it goes on wet, gets and can get the backing moist and then lead to mold. Um, okay, but then another question is, what is the R value of wood fiber board system? Let me go back to this. Um, so they come in various thicknesses, so I, can, I don't know the R value offhand, but I would say from the folks I've talked to, the, the wood fiber boards and the mineral wool boards are going to have a very similar R value for thickness. So if you're familiar with using like Roxel mineral wool um, or another brand, the wood fiber boards are going to be very similar in terms of R value. Okay. Um, the one, the benefit that they have, so kind of why people are excited about them is not because they say have a better R value than mineral wool. It tends to be because they have a drastically lower embodied carbon factor than mineral wool. Mineral wool actually has a, a fairly high embodied carbon factor. Uh, mineral wool, for those kind of unfamiliar, is the name mineral will kind of clue you in, but it's, it's rocks. And it, it requires an incredibly high temperature to create. So mineral wool actually does have a, a substantial embodied carbon amount in it, um, lower than, than foam usually. Um, but, but the wood fiber is going to have a drastically lower level. So I think the excitement around wood fiber and the desire to use it is driven not because, not from a greater uh, thermal protection it offers, but because of the lower body carbon effects. Okay. Um, another one. Yeah. And, and just and just get it and and I'll just get ahead of this just for a moment. I'm not actually quoting specific R values of materials because it does vary. It can vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. Most of these materials can be available in different thicknesses. Uh, so one board to compared to another board is going to have a different R value. Um, and it's just it's um, and there's you know in different types of materials there's also. Um, um, some, sometimes they can, the R value can change a little bit in temperatures and there's, there's a lot of different factors I go into it. So I'm not actually going to quote specific R values and materials today, but relatively I'll tell you that um, <laughs> that foam is going to have a greater R value per inch than mineral wool or wood fiber, uh, but it's going to have a lot of higher embodied carbon than it. So those are some of the trade-offs. Okay, and then for zip board, why is the zip board not on the exterior mm -hmm. side? 
since it's the because of the moisture barrier one would think it should be on the outside does that sound correct um the outside of the installation is that what they're 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 wondering about so i mean if we look at the left image for example where zip system is being used a zip system is on the outside of the cavity um so it's on top of the the studs and acting as a sheathing material and an air barrier system and then on top of that you have the mineral wool so if they're wondering why the zip system isn't outside of the mineral wool which might be the question um one is that in this case zip system is structural as well as providing the air barrier it is the sheathing material and when you put sheathing on the outside of installation it reduces um you know it's it's um structural strength a little bit so you're not, you're not going to do that um otherwise the um you know the mineral wool is going to keep that that warm as well so you're not really risking too much moisture issue there does that kind of get the question yeah i think so <laughs> yeah um there is so i will mention there is so it might also be related to I mentioned there is the zip R sheeting, which is a different material. So the, the distillery here, this image, they're just using traditional zip system, which is sheeting and an air barrier. The zip R takes that sheeting and air barrier and adds um, in a layer of insulation. So in this case, foam that's attached to the board. And in this case, the foam is actually on the inside. Um, so there is that trade-off where the, the mineral will, or the, the sheathing material and air barrier gets moved to the outside of the continuous insulation in that case. And it's also the case for something that you're seeing in the bottom. That is a structurally insulated um, uh, board there that has foam and has structural panels on, on the outside there. So it does vary based on your materials. But mineral wool uh, and wood fiber and polyiso are both perfectly you know, safe in terms of a moisture management to put on the outside of, of sheathing on the outside of an air barrier. Okay, and then another question about mineral wool. Since the mineral wool is water phobic, do you need the furring for rain screen? For rain screen? Yes, yes. So you do. So it is, um, I mean, it's not going to absorb the water, but you still don't want bulk water to, to sit on it. Um, you want to give it an opportunity to dry out. So the rain screen allows it to dry out. Um, it's basically the, the gist of it. Um, if, you know, if you had no rain screen, you just had the siding up against the, the mineral wool, the mineral wool itself, for example, might not, um, you might not have that soaking up water, but you're still gonna have that bulk water there. It might get soaked up by the siding instead if you're using wood siding, which can create problems. So it's just good practice to have that rain screen and allow it all to dry out. You're also going to have um, vapor dry from the inside of the building. And that vapor needs a way to get out. So that vapor is going to transfer through the mineral wool. And if it hits that siding directly, it's not going to have an easy way to get out. Um, and then you're going to risk um, having too much water vapor in the inside of the assembly. So having that rain screen also allows the vapor to get out. So you can think of it as kind of doing two things. That rain screen is having that gap. When water gets in, it can dry out, but it's also allowing the drying from the inside to the outside and having that gap where it can get out and escape. Good question. Okay. I'll show okay. some images of rain screens here when we get going and we'll, we can kind of see that a little bit in action. Um, we'll answer a lot more questions at the end. So I'm going to go through air barriers now and then we'll get into that vapor and water as well. And then we can ask a bunch of questions. So the air barrier, now this is where we're going to have that continuous air barrier around the building. So everything that I've told you so far is not an air barrier. You know, the, the, it's all about um, thermal control. Now we're getting into controlling air. Um, and we're gonna not only have a thermal barrier around the building, but we're also gonna eliminate gaps in that barrier. So holes, penetrations, all these things that go through it. We wanna find ways to in, uh, lit, um, reduce the amount of penetration, seal the ones that we do create. And for passive house, the whole goal of this is to have a low enough um, air transfer through the wall that we hit our, our air tightness metric for passive house, which is 0.6 air changes per hour. 
at 50 pascals of pressure. That's that's a goal. So this air barrier is meant to be that type. And I'll talk about that in one moment here. Just like everything else, though, lots of different materials that you can use. So there's tape sheeting, which I've shown already, zip system. Um, that is a dedicated air barrier when it's installed correctly. Uh, you have membranes. So what you're seeing on the right. So some of the images I've shown you, you may have seen this material. This is SEGA in this case, but it's just it's a thin membrane. And typically you're going to apply that directly over your sheeting. So you would use zip system in this case, you use you know OSB or another sheeting material, and then you would put your membrane over that. But there's also others. Those are, and I should say those right there are the two most common that I see here in this area by far, a zip system and some type of membrane. The ones on the bottom are less common, but still applicable and still used in pass projects. So you can have a fluid applied air barrier um, that can be sprayed or painted on, um, and you can have a vaporized sealant. Um, this is, uh, you might hear it by name for like air barrier, um, but this is something that you actually vaporize in a, and pressurize the building at the same time on the inside so that it kind of goes and, and fills gaps. Um, I will say that that one, the vaporized sealant, I haven't seen used in a pass out project as a dedicated air barrier. I've seen it used as a supplemental air barrier. What I mean by that is they'll have some other air barrier system, one of these other three in use, and then they'll simply use this vaporized sealant as a way to catch some air gaps and air leaks that they, they weren't able to, to catch beforehand. So I haven't seen it used yet as a dedicated air barrier on a pass out project. But these are different types of materials that you'll see no matter what you use, the principle of the air barrier is simple. It's continuous around the building. Um, when you look at the left, very easy, right? You have something called the red line test. Basically, means can you, you know, trace the the your project uh, without lifting up your pencil? That's your air barrier. You can do that easily when it's the whole building, like on the left. It gets really tricky, and the simple becomes really complicated when you zoom in on the details. And when you think about the air barrier. That's the critical element are those details and those transitions where we go from the wall to the roof or from the window to the wall. These are places where there can be little air gaps. We want to make sure that just like when you trace the entire building and have an air barrier, that you can trace the air barrier on those little transitions as well. And you can see how it changes and goes on. So let me kind of give a few examples here. Uh, this is a project in uh, Northampton, Massachusetts. They are, they are using the zip system as their uh, dedicated air barrier. Um, you'll notice that this zip system is brown. The other material you've been seeing is green. Um, that just indicates a different thickness. Uh, the brown uh, zip system, if you ever see that in action, is just a thicker board than the green board. Um, traditionally, I see it used more on roofs. Um, that I do on walls. Um, I see the green used more commonly on walls, but the, the brown stuff gets used on walls as well, and it's what they use here. So they have the zip system, it's completely taped up. Um, it's a fantastic air barrier, but what about the transitions? You'll see the little red circle there. What about where that air barrier hits the floor? How do they make sure that it continues? They're not wrapping zip system around there. They're not having sheeting go under the floor. Where, how does that connect? So you can kind of see here a little bit of how they're doing it. And they have it kind of highlighted in here where they have the, the red line going down and that's indicating that's where the zip system sheeting is, that's tape, that's our air barrier there. But then they're indicating how does it go around to the floor? How does it connect? What are they using? So they're using, in this case, a membrane flashing at the joint. So I don't know specifically what product they use, what manufacturer you know, it came from, but they're indicating they're using a membrane flashing at that joint to go around. Um, they're also indicating that they're using continuous sill sealer below the plate. So that's going to help seal the, the sill there. That's going to help provide the continuous air barrier. Um, so they have a few other places where they're indicating kind of what they're doing to continue that air barrier around the floor and into the building. And whatever you know system you're using for your air barrier, this is sort of the key to, to focus on are these transition areas. You can have the greatest insulation of zip or the greatest insulation of a SEGA membrane, but if you don't think about how you're transferring that to the floor or to the roof or around the corner, um, you're going to run into problems in the field when people actually have to do that and you end up with a, with a gap there. So make sure that you know how those transitions are going and make sure that you're communicating. For those on the team that are 
that are architects, include this on the drawings that you send to UGCs. If there's any, if there's any contractors out here on the, on this session and you get, you know, you get stuff sent from the architect without the air barrier highlighted, send it back and ask for it highlighted. That's something that needs to be communicated back and forth. And the key areas to watch out for, again, are these penetrations, just making sure that things are, are done right. So what I've seen teams do successfully, uh, these are images all from Finch Cambridge, and they, they did this where they had a dedicated person on site whose job it was to kind of go through and inspect these things. So for example, you have a, a plumbing trade come through, install some plumbing lines around there and do some taping of them. You wanted to have somebody else from your team who goes through afterwards and double checks that that is done correctly and taped properly. Um, you can't rely on just the one person to do it right. You need to kind of check. And these are all areas where you can see it. Um, that one image up in the top right, it's kind of, I, I like using it because that's actually one that they noticed that was incorrect. <laughs> so this is uh, before it was fixed. You guys can kind of look at it a little bit and think about what might be wrong with it. Um, but if you look at that tape, it's got a lot of bubbles there, doesn't it? Um, that doesn't seem like a big deal, having some bubbles in the tape, except it, it is. And it turns out on past files projects where we have to hit that, you know, very specific air tightness metric, having tape that isn't properly applied can make the difference between hitting it or not. Um, if it's one spot and one spot only, maybe not, but generally when you see it like this at one spot, you're going to see it like this at many other spots. So tape needs to be applied correctly. Why this happened in this case, it could be because the zip system boards, maybe they weren't flush against each other. So that seam was a little bit uneven. That's gonna make it difficult to apply tape. So having the boards applied correctly in the first place, that's one thing. Having it rolled on uh, at the proper uh, pressure amount, you can see it indicates right there, roll the tape. So it is upside down, so maybe they didn't see it. Um, but whatever you use, whatever material you use, it's gonna have some type of manufactured way of installing it whether that's pressurizing it by rolling it, um, follow those recommendations, make sure the team that's applying this knows what those recommendations are and is doing it correctly. Also use the recommended products for, for sealing. So this is, this is just showing you an image of, of a seal that was put on and then taped over for a plumbing line. Um, they, made this, they made this specific uh, seal to be used for this purpose, use it for that purpose, so that you have that seal there. Um, and also think about sequencing and layering of the air barrier. So this is this is the installation of a window buck. So just make so basically creating the, the rough opening for a window, but making sure. So what they are using here is a blue SEGA air barrier membrane system. There is on the walls, they're wrapping it around to the inside of the window buck, uh, which is great. Um, and they're also taking, you can see they're, they're taking the sill of that, which will be the sill, great. But they have to continue that tape up the edge a little bit. And what you can see they're doing here is when that blue membrane was installed, which was installed first, they left the gap there where they didn't actually apply it fully. And that was so that they could take that tape, which they were going to apply at a later time, and take it up the side, and then they're going to fold the blue Sega material back down. So it's layered. Um, think of that as like shingling style layering where, you, where the top goes over the bottom. If that was done in a case where say the Sega was first and they didn't think about the sequencing of it and that this tape would come on later, they would have just completely sealed that and then the tape would have went up and it would have been properly, would not have been properly layered. So those are just some things to keep in mind when we think about the air bear. Uh, is not just what product you're using, but how this is being installed and on these different transitions, how are you actually going to make sure that the people who are installing this are going to be able to do it correctly, do it right? Um, what information are you giving them? What training are you providing? And what, you know, how are you laying out the sequencing of this to allow for the proper installation? And all of this is dedicated to hitting this goal, 0.6 HGH 50. Pascal's of pressure. Um, I'm sorry, was there just somebody yeah, cutting that there? Yeah, a quick question. Oh yeah, um, go ahead. Just to uh, kind of to clarify, wouldn't all this checking of the taping um, go beyond the architect, more of like the responsibility of the passive house certifier who should check it during construction? That was a question. So, 
So who to check it during construction is a, is a great question. Um, if you're talking about the architect, you, I mean, we had a lot of people on this call. So there's, you know, I don't imagine all of you are architects. I imagine we got some other folks here as well. So this is, you know, we're talking about this for everyone. Um, who does this on a project? It needs to be clear who it is. It's probably not gonna be, you're right, the lead architect going through the project and doing this. But does the lead architect know who's gonna be doing it? They should. They should be having that conversation with their past house consultant. They should be having that conversation with their certifier or verifier on the project. They should be involved in that and they should know who it is. Um, and if you are on the contractor side of things, you need to plan for that in your, your timelines, um, of course, in your scheduling, because you need to have a space and a time where somebody can do that. So these are just things that everyone on this call is at kind of going to be at a different place on the project. But if you're working on a past house project, one of the big keys, and this is kind of in you know the the kind of past house 101 sort of trainings is to focus on integrated team. You guys all need to be on the same page. And if you're not the one doing this, it's important that you all are aware who that person is. Because if you're not, then that is a clue that it might not be happening. I hope that helps a little bit. <laughs> but you're right. It might not be on the architect to actually do it, but somebody does. And I hope you know who it will be. Um, so the air tightness is measured through a blower door test on site. So just uh, I, if, for folks, again, architect, you're not running the blower door test on site, but you are definitely, you definitely care about whether or not it passes. So how this is done, you're going to run it pre-occupancy after the building has been built. It's going to be uh, pressurized and depressurized. So you're going to take the average of it. And the average you want to hit is 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 pascals of pressure. Um, that compares to the typical a building code of three. I say typical because it varies from place to place and, and building codes are being updated. But in general, you're going to see a code built building at about three. You're going to see a really good built kind of what we might even call a high performing building at one ACH 50. Passive house is getting down to that 0.6 metric. With all that said, you don't just want to run a blower door test at the end. You want to do it multiple times to make sure that this number is being hit. So it's recommended to do it three times. Do a full envelope test once you have windows and doors are in. That way you're basically just testing the air tightness of the envelope. You do a couple others um, along the way as well. But the reason for this is so that you can catch leaks early. Um, the, the more you know of the building is, is finished, the more things that are closed up, the harder it becomes to find leaks. So think of your final. Your final blower door test is just there so you can get your certification. That's what that one's for. The ones you do before that are for your own benefit to so discover leaks and make sure that you hit this. I've also seen projects do this as many as five times on site. Um, anyway, so this is uh, this is Harbor Village, is a, a project up in Gloucester, Massachusetts. But they did uh, they did five blower door tests, and this is just some things that they did. So you can see them. Uh, uh, the lower images are then prepping for the first floor door test. So they had uh, some places where doors and windows weren't even installed yet. So they closed up those openings so they were sealed so they could do the air test. Um, and they discovered leaks. You can see the little circle areas. These are areas that they discovered through this floor door test. Basically, they ran it. They didn't quite hit the number they wanted. So they knew they had some leaks that were not intended and they identified them. I've seen teams use um, uh, smoke smoke guns to do this, to find those leaks. Um, you know, you can follow where the smoke goes, but it's incredibly important to identify this. You may kind of notice, and this may go back to that question somebody asked about, you know, this is not something the architect does. When it comes to the air tightness, this is the one thing that goes well beyond the design. I think, you know, your the type of insulation you're using and how you're designing your thermal barrier, how you're designing the water and vapor barriers we'll talk about, that can all kind of be taken care of in the design phase. You can pretty much feel good after you do your energy modeling and your, and your design that that's, that's good. The air tightness, there's so much that happens throughout the entire construction phase that impacts this, that you, you need to care about the air tightness the whole way through, off until that final board or test is done. Everyone needs to be focused on this number. And there's not really a point where, where the architect passes this off and the developer says, I'm not going to worry about this anymore. This is on the contractor. Everyone should be focused on this and thinking about this, the air tightness the entire time. 
All right, that's air tightness. Let's get into thermal bridging. Um, I think we have scheduled to 1.30, uh, but I do want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to go through thermal bridging, the vapor and water uh, aspects of the envelope, and then we'll open it up to any other questions you guys have. So we talked about creating a really good envelope so far. Hopefully through this, we've learned how to get that cavity insulation in there, how to have a really good uh, sweater of continuous insulation around the building. We also hopefully have it airtight at this point, but we also have thermal bridges in that envelope, places where we don't have a good amount of insulation, places where heat can transfer. So keep in mind, as we go back to the basic principle, heat transfers through materials with higher thermal conductivity. That's going to be wood, it does, steel, metal fasteners, plumbing lines, all different types of materials that go through that wall is you're going to have heat transferring through conductivity through that material. And that's a thermal bridge. Um, it's called that because these materials create a bridge through the assembly between the outside and inside or between materials where heat can transfer. What we need to do is we either need to remove them or mitigate the impact that they have. Um, we can't remove all of them. We're going to have thermal bridges, so that's why we also say mitigate because we want to reduce the impact that it has. Uh, these two images are just helpful to illustrate it. On the right, or sorry, on the left, uh, you're seeing the roof of a of a garage. There, um, what you're seeing is a garage that was very well insulated. The cavities are insulated, um, so the so the heat is not rising through the cavities and the snow is not melting. But where the studs are, um, or the 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 rafters. Um, in this case, the heat goes right through and melts the snow on top. Um, if they had a layer of continuous insulation on top of that, you would not see this. On the right, you're seeing a thermal image uh, from the inside of a home and you're just seeing, the, you know, you can see wood studs, you can see the metal fasteners even very clearly. So that's what we're trying to mitigate. What thermal bridges do is they're going to lead to heat loss, of course, but they're also going to have other impacts. They're going to lead to lower surface temperatures, which is going to impair thermal comfort. This is going to increase the risk of condensation, and then that's going to increase the risk of mold growth. So when we think about creating a really successful building envelope and trapping that heat in, you know, we also want to make it a very healthy and comfortable place to live inside that building. Thermal bridging actually has a pretty large impact on that. Um, areas of concern are going to be your weak points in your insulation. So obviously places where you don't have insulation like studs and wall headers and those other places we talked about. Uh, penetration. So anything that goes through that envelope is going to create a thermal bridge. So we want to think about how we deal with that. Uh, beams that meet the meet or pass through the wall, uh, outside features, say balconies, awnings, um, corners, window frames. These are all kind of the key areas to think about for thermal bridging. This is one example of a thermal break. So in this case, we have a, a floor, a, a concrete floor um, going against the wall. You can't really remove that. You're going to have a, you're going to have that there. So what do we do to mitigate that thermal bridge? We put in a uh, insulating material and that's that kind of a uh, light brown material on the right. It's uh, a material that goes in there and helps to reduce the transfer of thermal heat. Another example of that is here. This is a multifamily pass house building that was built. Um, it was a platform construction. So they had like a parking garage. On, on the bottom and then a raised first floor where the pass house envelope started. And that was all steel frame, that whole, um, that whole kind of first raised area. So steel conducts thermal heat very, very well. So we need to reduce the impact that that steel is having as a thermal bridge. So they did two things. On the left, you're sort of seeing, it's hard to see and that might be a little blurry, but what it's just showing you is that they completely insulated. So that steel beam will have insulation put all around it. The horizontal beam at the top, that will be completely insulated from the bottom. So they're gonna insulate that. But that steel is gonna allow heat to transfer from the ground through the steel beam up into the, the floor. So even though everything's insulated completely around it, or will be after, you know, at, at some point after this image is taken, it's gonna be completely insulated. You're still gonna have heat transferring through the beam. That's the thermal bridge. How do they mitigate that? So the image on the right is showing you a little, it's kind of, it's the lighter gray material that's off, directly on top of the, the vertical steel beam. Um, it's kind of, you might, might be hard to notice. It's just, you know, a little bit different color there and it's just a square um, a piece of material that's set on there. That is a thermal break. It's not gonna completely stop heat transferring uh, from the vertical steel beam to the horizontal steel beams, 
but it is going to reduce the amount of heat transferring. And this is a case where, you know, for the architects here, you're going to be working with a structural engineer, hopefully early to identify these type of areas that you're going to say, this is a concern for thermal bridging. And you're going to work with an engineer to figure out, okay, what type of material can we use that's going to both reduce thermal bridging, but, you know, not reduce the, the structural constraint of this. Uh, here's another example. This is, you know, a floor slab. Um, on the left, you're seeing kind of a traditional slab where you have a little bit of insulation underneath it. You have insulation on the, the foundation wall, but those things aren't connected and heat's transferring right through where those things aren't connected. On the right, you're seeing something that's fully insulated all the way around and you're having that insulation connecting from the outside of the foundation wall to under the slab. So now there's no bridge between the inside to the ground outside. On that previous image of the steel beam, someone yeah. asked, um, why is the top and bottom flange is cut? <laughs> That's a good question. I saw I'm laughing because you're not the first person to ask that. Um, and I still haven't got an answer. I did reach out to the team here, um, the, the project team for this. I, I don't actually know. <laughs> it's a good question. Um, okay. Um, yeah, but no, so multiple people notice that. And I, yeah, I still don't quite know why, why that's cut like that. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so here's one more example. This is the Tyler. This is uh, the retrofit project in, in Connecticut. You guys might be familiar with here, an old, uh, an old uh, high school that was retrofitted into senior housing. Um, with a the retrofit, they had to deal with the existing conditions of the building. Uh, and one thing they noticed when they did some uh, thermal modeling is that there was a little bit too much uh, thermal bridging between the floors, which were concrete, and the, and the wall. So they needed some way to reduce that. They couldn't put in a thermal break because this was already built. Um, there was all, the floor to the wall connection was already there. What they did do is they put a little insulation underneath. So you can see it's highlighted in orange on the drawing on the left, but they put insulation in there. So a couple inches down and a couple inches horizontally across the floor. The purpose of that is not to completely reduce thermal bridging or completely eliminate thermal bridging again. It's just to reduce the amount of thermal bridging. And they use modeling. In this case, uh, I believe they used uh, a, something called Therm which is a one type of uh, modeling software that you can use to model thermal bridging. But that's how they determined that at that connection, putting a little bit of insulation there was enough to get the thermal bridging down to a level that they wanted to. Um, just like with air tightness, thermal bridging, you're not always gonna solve every problem through design. You're gonna might notice some unexpected things when you get into um, construction. This is Finch Cambridge again, and, and something that they noticed uh, so we're actually at the top floor looking up at the roof of the building. And you might see in the left image some little kind of things sticking through. Uh, though that is an anchor for some solar panels that were installed on the roof. Um, they didn't really think about that as being a thermal bridge. Um, they didn't think about that as being, I think, part of the, the assembly at all. Um, but it was. It ended up being a permanent part of the assembly. And it created an uh, enormous amount of thermal bridging. You can see in the thermal image in the middle. So what do they do? Well, they added spray foam on top of it to stop the thermal bridging. But this is one example where you're not going to solve all of this through design. There's gonna be some things that come up during the construction phase that are unexpected, uh, even for thermal bridging. All right, water control. So the main thing to keep in mind for water is it will always find a way. Um, it transfers bulk water is going to hit the building. It's going to, you know, go down the, the roof and fall down the wall. You're going to have capillaries that are going to suck up water and different materials. Um, that can happen through insulation. It can happen through brick. It's going to, there's going to be various materials that can suck up uh, moisture. Obviously, air carries moisture. So any place where air can transfer, that's going to carry water um, and vapor diffusion. So there's lots of different methods and ways for air to, or sorry, for water to, to find a way into our buildings but it will. So we want to find a way to control it. So what the first thing we're going to do is give it a path to follow. The second thing we're going to do is plan for when that path fails. Um, but the plan is that bulk water is going to flow off the shingles. It's going to go into uh, gutters and it's going to be taken away from the building while 
water that hit the side is just going to you know go down the the siding and not get into the the wall assembly. Um, water that does get in, we're going to have different things like leaks that can help it seep out. Um, so areas where the water can seep out, um, and there's going to be ways for it to dry from the inside. So the biggest method of this is the concept of the rain screen. So the rain screen is a system that's creating that gap between the siding. Uh, and the actual wall system. Um, this is allowing for bulk water that gets in there, that gets behind the siding to have a place to drain out and to allow airflow in to dry out the assembly. So if anything gets in there that's wet, the airflow can help dry it out. If there's vapor movement from the inside of the building moving out, it has a space to flow out and not get stopped and get stuck and trapped inside the assembly. So the rain screen has a lot of different benefits in that sense. Uh, here you're just seeing a typical rain screen with vertical strapping. Uh, rain screen systems go from very simple, just wood furring strips or or you know pieces of small uh, small uh, lumber, or incredibly complex systems that hold heavy siding on the side of buildings. Uh, so we'll, we'll show a few of them. Um, on the left here, you have a drainage mat. I don't see these as much in in past valves projects. Uh, but they are, they can be a rain screen where instead of having any type of, of uh, like wood furring strips, you just put a mat and then you put your siding on top of the mat and the mat itself creates the, uh, creates the rain gap. Uh, more, more, more commonly, I see vertical or horizontal mats that are put on the side. Um, so here's two other examples. This is, so on the left, you have Finch Cambridge. Uh, and you can, I've seen, you've seen this image probably a few times already in this slideshow. Um, but Right now, I want you to focus on the white vertical lines that are going up on top of the mineral wool. That is a product known as Cascadia Clips in this case. But what it is, is it's providing a way to, one, hold the mineral wool <laughs> onto the assembly. It's also then allowing a place for the siding to attach to the assembly. So the siding attaches to those clips. Um, and then it has a little bit of a gap in between. So in between where the mineral wool is and in between where the siding is, there's a gap. So it provides a rain screen. So that's a method that's used on a larger building. On the right, you're seeing a different multifamily building uh, also use mineral wool for their exterior insulation, but they're using a system there called night wall. And that's kind of it's crisscrossing in this case, a different type of system, um, but providing the exact same, you know, solving the same problems. A lot finding a way to it. One attach, you know, siding, uh, thermal breaking, kind of how we attach it, and providing a gap so you can have a rain screen. So different materials out there, ranging from very simple pieces of wood to these more complex uh, and costly materials that we see used in a lot of larger buildings. The other thing to keep in mind with rain screens is we do need they need to be vented. So it's not just having that gap, but it's making sure that on the bottom and on the top. We have openings uh, so that that water can actually move. On the bottom, that opening needs to not only allow air to move, but also needs to allow bulk water to dry out. And on the top, we're allowing air to, to flow. There's different things that can be used for this. Generally, you don't want to just have a gap. You want to have some type of material in there. Uh, in order, the biggest reason for that is actually a, a pest. Um, ants, bees, different, different things that can get in there. Um, Having to what you're seeing here is, uh, I think this is called Coravent. It's a product here, this, this black material. There's lots of different types of materials, but in this case, it's just something there that's going to allow water to drain out and air to move, but it's going to be have small enough holes where um, your various insects and pests and rodents and things aren't going to be able to get in. Um, on the left, you're seeing a, just kind of a screen. You can also do kind of a metal mesh screen that you can also use in that method. So there's different methods there. But having those openings and having some something in there to keep pests out are important in rain screens. So vapor control. This slide is just giving you, for those of you who are kind of new to thinking about vapor, um, water vapor in this sense, you can compare it to steam uh, from a, a, pot of, a pot of boiling water. Um, you got, if you got the lid on, the, the water boiling underneath is very high pressure and very high humidity, and that air wants to go to low pressure. Low pressure is the stuff that exists outside of the, that pot of boiling water. When you remove the lid, you immediately notice that vapor coming up because it just wants to do it, and as soon as you create the opening, it goes up. 
Um, but let's imagine that the lid itself has a little bit of holes in it, very tiny ones. Now you're going to have some vapor that is able to get out of the lid. Um, when we think about vapor barriers, it's a type of lid with a hole, and they're going to have different amounts of holes, different size of holes, and that is what we consider to be the permeability of the air barrier. Um, so, in general, that permeability can be put into four sort of groupings or classes based on how permeable it is. So, class one is generally what we think of as things that are vapor impermeable. In other words, they do not allow for vapor transfer through them. Um, they're going to be things that are going to be noted as being one perm or, or less. You then have vapor semi impermeable materials vapor semi-permeable materials, and finally, materials are just vapor permeable and completely open. So what you use is going to be driven by many different decisions on your project. It's going to also be just um, based on the climate that you're in. There's going to be different reasons you're going to use different materials. Generally, um, you're going to use a type of vapor impermeable material on the floor, most likely uh, the lowest slab, for example, you're seeing here. But you're not going to use that in your wall systems or in your roof systems. Um, you're going to use a different type of system there. Um, in addition to that, we also have something out there that's available that are called smart vapor barriers. These actually change based on conditions. Uh, temperature, pressure differences can change how they, um, basically how open those holes are that allow vapor through. So, they're, so the perm rating of these materials can change. Um, there's also materials where they don't necessarily change, but depending on which way it moves, when it goes one direction, it's more open than when it goes the other direction. So they, these are called smart vapor barriers. So this information is just kind of there to let you know what's available for vapor control. But I kind of want to remind folks, if, you, if all these assemblies I've shown you images of so far are vapor open assemblies. None of those assemblies I've, sh I've shown you have a vapor barrier. You, you could think of them as having a semi impermeable barrier with that, um, say, a zip system or a SEGA membrane. They're going to be semi impermeable, but they're not acting as an actual vapor barrier. However, we still have in those systems, we still have vapor control because our control is allowing it to be open and allowing it to dry out and having that rain screen gap where that vapor can dry out when it moves outwards. So that is a method of vapor control, even when we don't have an assembly with a dedicated vapor barrier. I hope that kind of makes sense. But that's why I just, I want to, when you think about vapor control, think about it as vapor control and not a vapor barrier, because in a lot of these systems are not going to actually have a barrier. But we are going to think about vapor and we're going to find, you know, we're going to control it in some method. Um, this is the only slide I have on windows. Uh, we're not talking about windows today. Um, but they are a part of the building envelope. Um, they are the weakest part of the building envelope. Um, so no matter how good your windows are, they're going to be a weak point in the envelope. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, whatever that means for you, designing your, your project, that's, that's what it means for you. But their windows will always be the weakest part of it. With that said, um, you do want to get the best windows you can, uh, double or triple pane windows, black, uh, gas filled in between the, uh, the panes. Those things are pretty common. So the things you want to watch out for are the fact that they have spacers um, and the fact that the frames themselves have thermal breaks in them. And I would say that's probably the biggest thing to look out for when you're, you're thinking about kind of what windows you get and what windows you use is make sure those frames are, are thermally broken because that's where you're going to have, you know, you're going to have heat loss through there as a thermal bridge. So making sure that the, so the quality of the frame, I would say at this point, is probably should be more of a concern to you than the quality of the, the window panes and what type of glass you're getting and how many panes you're getting. So hope that helps. So one last thing to show you is all, everything I just talked about can be done completely differently in a passive house. Those who work on passive house projects know that we're not prescriptive. You just have to hit the energy metrics. So I described to you today things that are completely common and are used in the vast majority of projects I see. But then again, we have some that do it completely differently. This is Winthrop Center, a massive uh, skyscraper in downtown Boston that features the largest uh, square footage of certified passive office space in the world. And it's entirely glass on the outside. 
How they did it is through these curtain wall systems that were built in a factory. Um, some panes, so some sections of these walls had opaque glass um, and bitching glass that you could see through. Some sections had glass that had insulation behind it. And you can see the top right image. Look at that insulation. Look how many, I don't quite know exactly how many inches that is, but that's a lot of mineral wool. So they had very thick panes and the areas that they were not having glass that you could see through, not bitching glass, they just stuffed it full of insulation. Um, so you can see the image there on the right. Um, so somehow they made this work and made it a pass house building. So you guys out there can follow everything that I said today. You can also think through this yourselves and come up with all different kinds of ways to achieve the pass house metrics. But keep the, the principles in mind. Um, this is the loop, uh, just a, an image here, just kind of showing you what they did, I, I've shown you a lot of these photos already. I'm going to just skip through this in the sake of time and just remind you of these things. No matter what system you use for your building envelope, always pay attention to how it controls thermal heat transfer, air movement, vapor uh, movement, and water movement. So keep those things in mind and then keep the pass off metrics in mind and you should be fine. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stick around for questions. Um, but we are at time, so folks who have to jump off, I understand. Thank you so much for being here. Um, the pass us training CT email there is at the bottom for those who want to reach out to more information um, and more trainings. Also, you can reach out to me directly if you guys have questions about anything that I covered today. And now I'm going to stop talking and pause for any further questions. Okay, yeah, there are a few more regarding some of the slides you went over. Um, one of the slides you had towards the end and the there's a question about this is that barrier beneath the slab um mm. it was the one with all that green at the bottom um is that barrier beneath the slab a minimum of 10 mils to meet the code i can't speak on the on on the code uh with, with confidence i'm sorry um <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I, I don't, yeah. It's, it's that, so that material in that image was uh, a vapor barrier in that case. We weren't just controlling vapor, it was an actual barrier to vapor movement. As far as how thick it was in terms of the, the code, I, I, I can't comment on it. Sorry. Okay. Um, back to the blower door testing, there was a question about like what numbers should you be, look, should we be looking for in, the progress of the testing. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the, the main number that you want to look for is the 0. 0.6 ACH50. Um, if you have an earlier test that's not hitting that, your final test isn't going to hit it either. So that's kind of the first phase to be at. Um, do you want to be in a place where that or those earlier tests are performing even better than that? Um, that's project to project basis. I've seen some projects where they'll set a goal of saying our goal on this is to have that be 0.5 ACH50 and we want this early test to hit that 0.5 ACH50. That is both a goal they can focus on and it also gives them say a little bit of a wiggle room there if something does go a little bit wrong um, they can hopefully still hit 0.6 at the, at the end. So that's you know kind of on a project by project basis but it's not a bad idea to set a, a lower goal um, but the big one to just keep in mind is 0.6. If you can consistently hit that, uh, can, can consistently be, be lower than that, then you're going to be, be fine. Okay. And we might have just one more question left to fit in. Um, yeah. Does vapor control differ in warm versus cold climates? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I can't speak a lot about, you know, what we see in more warmer climates, like what, like that, I showed you that uh, photo, photo, of course, of that house in Texas, when I told you the story about the, the, the power challenges there and keeping it warm. Um, I don't know what they use for a vapor barrier there. I, I'm less familiar with those, those climates, um, but that is going to be a determined, one of the, one of the factors that goes into what type of vapor control you want. At the end, the other way to think about vapor, I didn't really talk about it in this sense today, but it's humidity control. We kind of are we're more familiar with humidity than we are kind of with water vapor because we experience humidity. 
So we kind of all know kind of how that works. In, in the winter, our in, the inside of our buildings are going to be a lot more humid than the outside of our buildings. And that humidity is a form of water vapor. So that water vapor, that humidity is going to move through the wall. Um, you know, warmer climate, we're going to see the opposite. Um, a lot in the summer, we're going to have a very humid outdoor environment. And that humidity is going to, that water vapor is going to be driven to come inside the home. And you might, in those environments, want to have more of a dedicated barrier to keep that transfer from happening um, than we do here. In these, in this climate zone, uh, climate zone five here, both Connecticut and the kind of New England, southern New England area, um, we don't see that as big a concern. Even though we do get some humid summers, it it tends not to be. We haven't seen issues in wall assemblies because of that yet. As long as those assemblies have that ability to dry out. The biggest key is making sure that we don't create a way that vapor can get stuck in the wall. We want it to, to we want it to be able to either move or not get in there in the first place. Um, and the principle behind a vapor open assembly is that it's going to get in there, but it's also going to be able to get out. Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so that it looks like it, we're at one thirty one. So we kind of don't have time but we have a couple more questions um please just send them our way to the email address that's on the screen and hopefully we can get them answered um also just a reminder that this training is aia connecticut approved for ceus so we will be sending out a separate survey for you all to fill out if you do want to get the uh, CEUs um, and it'll be sent out in an email along with a link to the recording. Um, but yeah, that is all for today. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was a great presentation. And yeah, we will call it an end. Have a good rest of the day, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.